Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of John Balson? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoyed this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case, move to the timeline of the incident, then offer my analysis. John Balson was born sometime around 1984 and lived in England. He earned a master's degree in 2005 and was interested in pursuing a career in journalism. He found work at a newspaper in England called Maidenhead Advertiser. John had a brother named Michael who died after falling out of a window in 2011. This same year, John left his job at the newspaper and started working as a reporter for Barcroft Studios. Over time, he was promoted, he became a news editor, bureau chief, and finally a senior producer. John left his position in September 2019 to become a freelance producer. Throughout his career, John was involved in many different media productions. For example, a Channel 4 show called Bear About the House, Me and My Supersized Pet, Blood Justice on a and &E, Shake My Beauty, Season 2 on Facebook Watch, Dog Dynasty on Amazon Prime, a Netflix series called Making a Serial Killer, Meet Mary Murder on Lifetime, and Secrets of a Murder Detective on CBS. In 2018, before becoming a freelance producer, John met a woman named Yumino, and the couple became romantically involved. They married and went on to have a daughter in April 2021. The family moved to the United Kingdom and lived with John's parents in East London. Starting in January 2024, John worked on a series produced by Alaska TV for Channel 4. The series was titled In the Footsteps of Killers and examined cold cases in the United Kingdom. John was working on season three of the show. By this time, the freelance television business was in bad shape. John had to compete with many candidates to get the position. He was genuinely excited about being selected and starting the project. Three times a week, John had to commute to an office in West London that was two hours away. The four-hour round trip was challenging, but John recognized he was lucky to be working at all. One case that John was working on for the series involved an unsolved murder in London. The family of the victim did not want to be involved with the episode. John allegedly received a threat from an individual associated with a person he was researching. This was particularly frustrating because John thought he had actually solved this murder. Before moving to the timeline of the incident, let's hear a word from today's sponsor, Factor. Eat stress-free this summer with Factor's delicious, ready-to-eat meals. Every fresh, never-frozen meal is chef-crafted, dietitian approved and delivered right to your door. Factor's meals are ready in just two minutes. There is no preparation and there is no mess. All you have to do is heat and enjoy. When things get hectic, Factor is flexible. Change your order every week with plans from 4 to 18 meals per week or pause or reschedule your deliveries anytime. Factor is the perfect solution if you're looking for fast, upscale options done easily and it's less expensive than takeout. After a long day of researching, analyzing, and recording, Factor is my go-to solution to stay efficient and avoid wasting time on cooking, or going to the grocery store. They offer nutritious options that make it easy for me to stick to my goals. Head to factor75.com or click the link below and use code DRGRANDE50 to get 50% off your first Factor box and 20% off your next month of orders. That's code DRGRANDE50 at factor75.com to get 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next month of orders. Now moving to the timeline of the incident. On March 17, 2024, John took his three-year-old daughter swimming and then returned home. He played video games and consumed alcohol. At this point, John noticed that he was getting tired and had trouble concentrating. Despite this, he went to work the next day as planned. After getting up to use the restroom, John became disoriented and perceived the walls of the hallway bending away from him. It was a disconcerting experience. In addition to this odd visual symptom, John had pressure behind his eyes and a headache. He returned home after work 
reasoning that everything would be fine tomorrow. Unfortunately for John, when he woke up the next day, he still had the symptoms. It felt like his bed was moving underneath him. John visited a physician who told him that he may have an ear infection. This tentative diagnosis did not appear to be correct. A specialist later told John there was nothing wrong with his ears. John started keeping a journal so he could track the symptoms of his mysterious condition. He described seeing a flickering orb when he would close his eyes. Given the increasing amount of stress he was under with his medical condition, John took a vacation to Broadstairs in early April. This seaside community is 85 miles east of London. During his vacation, John had panic attacks, which caused him to leave an art gallery and a restaurant. On April 11, John took the train back to London and went directly to Queen's Hospital in Romford. He was determined not to leave the hospital until he was supplied with a diagnosis. Physicians told John that he had anxiety and gave him diazepam, which is the generic version of the benzodiazepine, Valium. John continued to have symptoms including insomnia, panic attacks, headaches, and dizziness. In addition to taking anti-anxiety medication, he took antidepressants and medication designed to treat migraine symptoms. He also tried other strategies like counseling, massage therapy, vitamins, a new mattress, and new eyeglasses. An MRI came back negative. Medical professionals did not know what was wrong with John. On April 19, John went to see a mental health clinician. He mentioned that he was having some thoughts of bringing harm to himself. Two days later, he acted on those thoughts and was returned to Queen's Hospital. No beds were available, so John was told to sit in a chair as security guards watched him. He sat there for 31 hours before he asked to be discharged. John continued to suffer. He stopped working and lost weight. He was no longer able to read, write, watch television, use his computer, cook, play the piano, or jog. On May 13, 2021, John finally received a diagnosis. A physician told him that he most likely had vestibular migraines. This type of migraine headache prominently features dizziness or vertigo. The condition can be treated, although not necessarily cured. A common treatment outcome would involve a 50% reduction in headaches. John scheduled another appointment with the same physician for May 17. It appeared as though things were finally looking up for John. He finally had a diagnosis and hope of improvement. Before the next appointment arrived, John had thoughts of bringing harm to himself. He was advised to return to Queen's Hospital, but his prior negative experience there discouraged him to the point where he did not go. On May 17, 2024, the day that John was supposed to see the physician who diagnosed him, and begin traveling the road to recovery, he brought an end to his own life. John Balson was 40 years old. Now moving to my analysis. Despite there being many variables which could have contributed to John's death, the primary focus of this tragedy has been on his career choice. TV production companies involved in true crime shows have attracted a lot of negative attention due to this case. Some people are calling for the entire industry to be revamped. For example, John's wife said, quote, The loss of John Balson is not just his life. It's a failure of the industry. The industry can find a replacement the next day, but there will never be another John Balson, unquote. She stated that John faced unrealistic expectations and said, quote, A major change needs to be made as a whole industry, unquote. Other people look at John's case differently. They believe there has been a rush to vilify TV production companies. They argue that John's behavior was probably based on many factors. This brings me to the question, was John's work as a freelance true crime producer a primary factor in his death? Let's take a look at the evidence both for and against the idea that it was, starting with the factors that support this theory. In many ways, including through writing in his diary, John communicated his frustration with being a true crime producer. For example, he had to spend many hours conducting research and traveling. Only rarely would he get a chance to rest. John referred to his concern about getting justice for victims as a fatal mistake, implying that the production companies did not share his values. 
He believed that the TV industry treated freelance producers as expendable and were disrespectful to people involved in the shows. As far as the dark nature of true crime work, John wished he could have focused on more uplifting stories and said, quote, I let in the darkness with my obsession with crime and murder in my career, unquote. One particular case reminded him of when he lost his brother in 2011. John implied that he became overly sympathetic with people who had been affected by crime. So he started to feel the way they felt. There is the sense that John perceived an ethical problem with being a true crime producer. For example, 10 days before his death, he wrote in his journal, quote, I'll have to learn to do a new job and a new career, or at least one where I'm not in this conflict of whether what I'm doing is bad or not. I need to do something better with my life that serves people on the planet better, unquote. Many freelance producers have expressed frustration with their line of work. For example, they note that the business features long hours, financial insecurity, discrimination, stress, and no clear career track. Furthermore, television freelancers in general spend a lot of their time without a job. There was a survey of over 4,000 of them in the UK, which indicated 68% were not working and 37% planned on quitting the industry. John was aware of how the industry was struggling. He said, quote, as the money in the industry dried up, I was required to do more and more hours and take on more and more stress, unquote. His agreement with Alaska TV indicated that if he became sick and could not work for more than seven days, his contract could be terminated. Now moving to the factors that contradict the idea that John's death was primarily caused by his job. Even though John could have lost his contract with Alaska TV by missing work, the company told the media that despite their agreement with John, they encouraged him to take as much time off as he needed. John's death occurred two months after he developed migraine headaches, but he had been working as a producer for years. This makes it seem as though the cause of his death was more likely related to the migraines. John suffered a number of symptoms like insomnia, headaches, and dizziness from the migraines. He had no history of mental disorders. It is reasonable to believe that John's anxiety, panic attacks, and depression occurred in response to his physical symptoms. If his work as a true crime producer was the problem, one would expect to see the symptoms of something like post-traumatic stress disorder. John did have panic attacks, sleep disturbance, and trouble concentrating, but he was missing a lot of the other symptoms of PTSD. For example, he did not have nightmares, intrusive thoughts, flashbacks, a feeling of detachment, hypervigilance, or anger outbursts. Other than one case that reminded him of his brother's death, John did not strongly connect his symptoms to any specific trauma-related event at his work. John partially attributed his symptoms to his job, but the connection he made wasn't necessarily specific to the true crime component. For example, John said, quote, I let my work-life balance get out of control, unquote. That could happen at any job. He also told a friend that he broke himself from working too hard and said, quote, I'm not sure what pushed me over the edge, but maybe it has just been building up for years, unquote. Again, these complaints are not specific to being a true crime producer. Anybody with a job could have these same complaints. John was adjusting to having a painful and disruptive medical condition, yet the hospital he went to did not really care about his mental health. Queen's Hospital has been compared to a scene out of a zombie apocalypse movie. The emergency department, which is called accident and emergency, is so overcrowded that the corridors are always lined with patients. The hospital even installed call buttons in the hallways. Maybe the hospital was to blame and not the television production companies. When considering all the evidence in this case, do I think that John's status as a true crime producer was the primary factor in his death? No. In my opinion, other factors were at play. What do I think happened in this case? This is just a theory, my opinion. John developed migraines, which caused him pain, discomfort, and misery. Mental health symptoms like panic attacks came about, and he was not given proper treatment. The anxiety, panic, and depression caused John to search for a stressor to explain what he was feeling. This led him to carefully examine his line of work. He became more aware of how stressful his job was and focused on the disadvantages. 
in a sense, his job became the primary suspect in the crime of causing him harm. A job that he could handle now seemed daunting and merciless. John was looking at his career through a dark lens. He realized that his work was not fulfilling. Many of the shows he produced extracted drama from tragedies rather than creating knowledge through insightful analysis. John came to realize that he was not fulfilling a meaningful purpose, at least not from his perspective. Through his pain and suffering, he learned to hate his line of work. Ultimately, John's most drastic decision came about because of the migraines and a mental health system that could not respond effectively. It is convenient to blame true crime production companies, and maybe being exposed to dark topics did not help John. But the industry is not the villain in this particular true crime episode. Those are my thoughts on the case of John Balson. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They consistently generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching. Sometimes people ask me what my experiences have been with true crime producers, because I have been on a few different true crime shows, just really small parts, an unpaid contributor. I never dealt with John Balson, but I have dealt with a few different producers over the years. I would say about half of them are pretty good. Half the production companies are pretty good too. The other half I think is problematic. There have been instances where I found these companies to be pretty disorganized and the producers to be disorganized as well. They have a certain amount of money they're given by these streaming services or other companies to produce a certain number of episodes, maybe just one episode, maybe 10, maybe more. And they start to really feel the pressure of that. Like they have to get these episodes done. They don't always worry about creating the best episodes, just ones that are good enough to satisfy the contract. I have had some experiences where I have traveled for these different shows, like to be a contributor, I've driven sometimes hundreds of miles to visit with them when they're in a certain area. I sit down, I do my part, and I leave. They are supposed to compensate contributors for expenses. They don't ever pay the contributors, and that's fine, but they are supposed to compensate for those expenses, and I have found that they don't always do that. Through my time appearing in various shows, I probably lost about $800 in expenses when you count mileage, meals, uh, parking, things like that. Sometimes they pay for some of them and then just stop answering emails. Other times they've just ignored my requests altogether. So I put together a list of the expenses they said they would reimburse me for. And there's just crickets on the other end, like nothing. Almost like they went out of business, but I see they're still producing episodes. I don't even really care so much about that, although it would have been nice to be compensated for what I spent. The part that really bothers me is how they tend to contact people to contribute and then they just disappear. So they waste hours and hours of my time, like I'll review a case and answer all these questions for them, and then they'll disappear. And they still produce the episode. So it's not like they lost the contract or they changed the direction they were going. They simply vanish. Like they don't really care about the contributors. They don't respect people like me enough to not waste my time. So my position on these production companies has kind of changed over the years. When they would first contact me, in the, in the early days of being contacted, I was happy to drive almost anywhere I could reach in a reasonable amount of time, sit down, do the interview, and leave. Of course, there was preparation involved, sometimes a lot. But now I'm skeptical. I don't really think I need to financially support them through not getting compensated for my expenses. So they're in the business to make money, yet they're really spending my money by having me on the show. I'm not going to pay them to be on these shows. If they want to pay my expenses up front, maybe I would consider it. I don't know. The only production companies I really entertain anymore are the ones that come to my house and set up and record right here. I have no problem with that. But I don't really feel inclined to travel anymore. I think this connects in with the story because these producers 
are really taking advantage of contributors, right? They are building a profitable company on the backs of people that are volunteering their time and in some cases not being given expenses. I had that happen two separate times with two separate production companies. So maybe that's not enough to really establish a pattern, but it still shows the disrespect that's out there. And I think, as I mentioned, wasting my time is even worse. That's a worse offense in my book. So to be contacted and spend hours and hours with these producers, and then for them to come back and uh, change directions, or just, like I said, not communicate. They just stop emailing and calling like you were never talking to them in the first place. So I think it really sends this message like, these companies are more important than people who make videos on social media, right? Like it, it establishes this hierarchy, like they're real and somehow what people like me do is not real or it's not as important. And really the way things are changing, the way social media has become so prominent, I view the TV production industry as being in trouble, not social media. I think the future is right here with the type of work that I'm doing. I would not want to work for a production company. I'm not really keen on the idea of having a TV show someday. I'm pretty happy with this. I don't think that television is the next great step in my career. I think I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing right now. So I get my message across. I help demonstrate critical thinking and teach about mental health symptoms. I enjoy this work. I don't really like the products that a lot of these production companies produce in the sense that they're a substitute for what I do. I enjoy them. I think they're entertaining, but I don't really see them as the future of in-depth analysis. I think that it's important to enter into the world of true crime and create knowledge through a meaningful analysis, not simply mine the stories for a salacious component or for dramatic purposes. So I guess I have some ideological differences with these true crime production companies as well. I don't know if that really adds much to this particular case, but a lot of people have asked me about my thoughts on true crime television shows and how that relates to social media and meaningful analysis. So I thought I'd offer my thoughts. Thanks again. Talk to you soon.